I'm Mark Lodato, Dean of the SI Newhouse School of Public Communications, and I'd like to welcome everyone to tonight's discussion. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge with respect the Onondaga Nation, Firekeepers of the Haudenosaunee, the indigenous people on whose ancestral lands Syracuse University now stands. I'm pleased to welcome the 2023 winners of the Toner Prizes for Excellence in Political Reporting, which recognizes the best national or local political reporting in any medium or on any platform, print, broadcast, or online. The Toner Program was established at the Newhouse School in 2009 to celebrate the life and work of the late alumna Robin Toner, a 1976 graduate and the first woman to serve as national political correspondent for the New York Times. And of course, our moderator tonight for our discussion is Margaret Taleb. Margaret joined Syracuse University in January following a 30-year career covering American politics and the White House. Margaret covered the Trump and Obama administrations along with both Obama presidential campaigns and Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential run. Experience, drive, and a passion for journalism makes Margaret the perfect person to lead our new Institute for Democracy, Journalism, and Citizenship. I don't usually get to say this stuff about you, uh, which is a joint effort of the Newhouse School and the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs. The Institute's mission is to engage in nonpartisan research, teaching, and public dialogue aimed at strengthening trust in news media, governance, and society. So we're grateful to have Margaret up from Washington tonight and her leadership on these issues, especially as we enter a political election season. So I'm thankful for all the excellent work produced by our Toner Prize winners over their commitment to fact-based reporting. And I look forward to a great discussion tonight. So over to you, Margaret. Good evening to all of you. Uh, obviously, I'm excited to spend a little bit of time uh, talking to you guys um, about your award-winning journalism and getting to introduce you to these students and some of these students to you. Um, uh, for all of you in the audience, I hope that these honorees work um, and methods and reflections on their work can inspire you to go net some big fish and to do it um, with precision and accuracy and, and grace as they have. Uh, this year's Toner Awards honor coverage of one epically huge and incredibly sensitive complicated scoop with implications that could last for decades. And that is uh, the news weeks ahead of the time it actually became official. Um, that the Supreme Court was about to reverse Roe versus Wade, and that that was going to end 50 years of abortion rights protections at the national level for U.S. women, and it was going to ignite a political firestorm um, with instant implications and implications that could last for decades. And our, uh, our awards also honor true excellence in local political reporting by a TV news team led by this guy uh, from Tennessee, whose chief investigative reporter sought to show viewers how laws actually get made in the state's General Assembly when there's a political supermajority with a lock on power. The premise of the revealed investigation really is that citizens must understand how things really work if you're gonna be able to hold your elective representatives accountable or get the government that you deserve. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome the Politico team represented by Josh Gerstein, Alex Ward, and Peter Canellis and the great Phil Williams of WTVF-TV in Nashville, AKA Nashville's nosiest bitch. That is the title that, it's not my title, it is a title that has been conferred upon him by, uh, <laughs> by John Oliver and, uh, and so it sticks and we're going with it. Um, so um, Phil Williams is the chief investigative reporter celebrating 25 years at News Channel 5. Do I have that right? In addition to the Toner Award, uh, you're the recipient this year of the John Chancellor Award for Excellence in Journalism, the first local TV journalist um, to receive that honor. You're a four-time recipient of the DuPont Columbia Award, a three-time recipient of the George Foster Peabody Award. You might say Phil's a local legend. Uh, we are told that there's another saying in Nashville. It's less catchy, but it's cute too, uh, that if Phil Williams calls, call your lawyer because you're definitely in trouble. Um, Josh Gerstein is a senior legal affairs reporter for Politico. His passion is the intersection of law and politics. And he's been reporting for decades, I can attest to it because we somehow got decades older together, on the most politically sensitive and salient investigations, prosecutions, and trials of our times. That includes special counsel probes into uh, former President Donald Trump, 
and uh, President Joe Biden. He's not a lawyer, but he knows more about the courts and spends more time reading legal documents than a lot of lawyers do. Alex Ward, Politico's national security reporter, anchor of the National Security Daily before joining Politico. Uh, Alex was the White House's, uh, the White House and national security reporter at Vox. I skipped over, by the way, that's Alex on the end. Um, he was also associate director in the Atlantic Council's Brett Scowcroft Center on International Security. That's where he worked on military issues and U.S. foreign policy and helped develop the skills that you use to write today and report today. And previously wrote the NATSEC 2016 newsletter for War on the Rocks, where he covered the presidential election and candidates' views on national security. And finally, Peter Canellos. Uh, Peter's the managing editor for Enterprise at Politico. He also spent many years at the Boston Globe as Washington bureau chief, as editorial page editor. You oversaw two Pulitzer Prize winning projects. You're the author of The Great Dissenter, the story of John Marshall Harlan. Um, America's judicial hero. It was the top 20 book of 2021. Another 2009 book, The Last Lion, The Fall and Rise of Ted Kennedy. That was a top 10 New York Times bestseller, graduate of UPenn and Columbia Law. You've spent a lot of your career also helping to develop young writers. Uh, and uh, tonight, uh, well, you know, guys aren't so young anymore, but uh, all of your work is a testament to that. Uh, also, uh, he's a lead organizer of the Global Fellowship Program at the International Women's Media Foundation. Okay, now you have the bios, let's get to the conversation. Um, let's start by talking about both of these really important projects that you're all being honored for tonight. On the surface, I think they seem like two really different types of assignments, uh, right? In Tennessee, Phil, you're starting with an idea. I wanna show people how the process really works. In Washington, Politico is starting with a document, an, exp an explosive document, it is a draft document um, that's not official till it's official, and that was never supposed to land in your hands, at least if you ask Chief Justice Roberts, it was never supposed to land in your hands. So if you're an outsider looking in, for an observer's perspective, these seem like different kinds of stories because Phil went looking for his, and yours just landed in your laps, or is that not at all what happened? Without disclosing sources and methods, how accidental was your scoop? And Peter, given your role in senior management, was there a moment when you just considered that this was too hot to touch and not to run with it? How did you all think about your responsibility and how hard did you pursue the incredible scoop that you eventually got? Well, I can, <laughs> I can speak to the second part of your question. Um, <clears throat> I think that, uh, we're limited, obviously, in what we can say about the sourcing. Uh, this was the subject of an investigation by the Supreme Court. Um, I, speaking for myself, uh, I value some of the traditions and norms in Washington. And I think that the idea that the Supreme Court would sort of share draft opinions among what turned out to be a rather large circle of people uh, with a sort of understanding that they would not be released is one of those norms and traditions that when you when you realize that Politico has gotten a hold of this and that you know this is something that would puncture that norm and and the sense of trust that goes behind it you you have to have some sense of what you're doing I think uh, and the sort of moral implications of what you're doing in there. On the other hand, and this is part of it. Um, the Supreme Court, I think that that very deference to Supreme Court procedures has a detrimental effect on society because it prevents scrutiny of the Supreme Court. It suggests that these justices are so far above the normal, you know, discourse that we have in Washington and the normal kind of scrutiny that journalists provide that um you know, we we give special deference and they deserve special consideration. Long before this issue popped up, uh, I have obviously been interested in legal journalism like Josh has for many, many, many years. Uh, and it has occurred to me that the Supreme Court didn't was not getting the kind of scrutiny it deserved. And this was even before 
uh, today's ideological divide. And I, I say that not because it sounds like you're saying, ah, oh, they're, they're more conservative. It's not that they're more conservative, but it's that there was a movement designed to change the Supreme Court that was very political and very calculated in its nature that then succeeded in changing the Supreme Court and succeeded in bringing about an outcome that was openly discussed as being the priority of that. I think that whole set of circumstances uh, is an argument for more coverage of the Supreme Court, more coverage of the outside forces that are affecting the justices uh, beyond just their conscience and their legal acumen. Um, and indeed, Politico's decision to go forward with this story, I think opened the floodgates to that kind of doctrine. So when you say, was it too hot to touch? I think that you know any journalist needs to think in a responsible way about the outcome of their coverage and the larger implications for the country and the world of what they're doing. Um, so I think it does behoove us, and it did behoove us to have conversations along those lines. Um, but I think the decision that was made to reveal it actually served the country far better than if we had sort of said, "Oh, you know, this is a private document. We're gonna, we're gonna, you know, ignore it or something." You know, um, Josh and Alex, uh, you may not have known. We all may not have known what the court was going to do on Roe v. Wade. But everybody knew that it was that there that something was going to happen, and that something was going to happen by sometime in June. So, um, is without knowing that you again without betraying anything that you can't betray, um, without knowing what that draft opinion was going to say, were you still hoping to be able to break news um, around the machinations of the case or the, the implications of the case? You had. I guess what I'm trying to get to for a room of students, some of who are going to think about how to cover beats is um, how does a reporter weigh waiting for the story to happen versus proactively trying to find out what's happening and make news? Um, well, what I would say, Margaret, is, you know, I think that the issue with coverage of the Supreme Court before the last year and a half or so was not the volume, right? Because like the it's not like we don't know or there's no reporting on Supreme Court decisions when they come out. There's quite a bit. And there's a press room up there and there's people that sit there and the news wires and all or number of major news organizations send out stories. And there are even sometimes feature stories that dig into the cases that are about to be argued. So it wasn't the, the volume or that people were ignoring it. Um, that may be a little different than, than Phil's coverage where you've seen a lot of state legislatures that are basically completely neglected by by the news media. So it was more that we weren't treating the Supreme Court the way we treat the other institutions in Washington. And, you know, um, the, the co Congress and the White House get what I regard as generally pretty rigorous 360 degree coverage. Um, you know, they, we cover the speeches that the president gives, we cover the statements that the, the Senate majority leader makes, and if they pass some major legislation, we report on that. But journalists report on a lot of other things, the, the plethora of like newsletters and things that are covering these things in Washington are testament to the fact that it's not only what's officially happening, but what's unofficially happening. What are people saying in the hallway? What do people think is going to happen two weeks from now? This is all part of what we expect from people that are covering Congress or covering the White House. It's not sufficient to go to the White House briefing and write down what they say, right? That's part of the story, but it's only one part. I do think for many years, that is by and large how the Supreme Court was covered. It was covered, what cases are being argued this term? Here's the list of cases. Here's when the arguments are. We'll go to the arguments. Now we're into May and June. And I hear the decisions are coming out. And here's what this justice said. And here's what that justice said. And a few of these justices made speeches this year. And that was fundamentally the way it was done. And, you know, I think as Peter is saying, some of us that have been interested in legal journalism for a while are thinking that this should be done in a different way. And that there are other, the similar kind of maneuvering by other people that are interested in the outcome of these cases that's actually uncannily similar to things that are done on Capitol Hill in terms of who could I take to dinner to try to make this case come out? 
the way that I want? Wh whose spouse maybe could I hire for a job? Um, do you know what I mean? Who could I fly to Alaska um, and possibly have some impact on how decisions come out? Mm -hmm. So that was all going on. And that has been the bread and butter of coverage of Congress um, and to some extent, the executive branch. But we haven't years, covered the court but like not our politicians. The yeah. of, of the Supreme Court. And so I think that our story helped unleash a new wave of covering the court. Obviously, there have been a lot of other stories that have been superb by ProPublica, by the New York Times. Politico has done some talking about all this stuff, this whole maelstrom going on around the court that for many, many years was, I don't want to say ignored, but it was undercovered compared to what was happening in the, the center ring of the circus. And maybe that center ring was not quite as important as everybody thought it was. When you hear your two colleagues, what is it making you think about when you look back to those days and weeks, days, as you were preparing to break this story? I mean, we were all nervous, right? <laughs> we knew the enormity of it. Um, I think the, to give political a lot of credit, like everyone, you know, once we had the thing, it became like, all right, how do we, how do we do this in the right way? How do we do it in the most responsible way? And how do we make sure that we're doing a service for the public and not just, hey, here's a cool scoop for us, right? Um, in the, if you read this, if you read the story itself, like we could have very easily done a 400 word story that said, and put up a document and let readers do it. But no, we, you know, spent a lot of time making sure we we read it, we dissected it, we got the fairest way, presented to the public in the fairest way possible, and did justice to it. It's a long document, right? We don't expect everyone to read it, but we want you to know not, of course, what the main top, what the headline of it is, but also contextualize it, explain why we got to the moment and why it is what it is. So I just remember the the nerves of it, the the intentionality behind it, and really, our goal was to. I'm just proud of the fact that we really made sure that we captured the mo the moment and contextualized as much as we could have. When we easily, and I can imagine other outlets just going like, "Here's a document we got," you know. Um, Word cloud, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, I, I think our the story is the story was a couple of stories as well, right? It was there's this document and it is what it is. Then there's this thing happened at the Supreme Court. And then there's, this is a major moment for the nation. So how do you write all of that? And how do you contextualize all of that in one story? And we, did, we took a lot of care to do that. Did you all know at the same time that it was like, holy, like, did you all know you were, that this was like story of a lifetime as you were touching Well, I mean, one thing we were talking about in Professor Gallagher's class earlier was just the, enormity of the amount of vetting that needed to go into this because we're living in the era of Project Veritas and a lot of hoaxes and the Hitler diaries. That was 40, 50 years ago. But um, it's, uh, you know, it's an existential moment for the publication when you're going to be publishing something like this and you have to be as close to 100% sure as you can possibly be that this document was authentic and that this was happening. And so you were talking before about, is this something you saw it? Is this something you, you know, how do we lay the groundwork for it and all that? I would say the institutional effort was in establishing what we had to a degree of certainty the that was of it. led to us to, to, to make a move that really would have redounded negatively for the publication, hugely, but also negatively for the whole profession. And, and trust for public uh, so, yeah. so being able to pull something like that that off. So uh, I think sometimes when people hear about it, they think it's the, the decision is like, okay, well, here it is. Let's just decide how we're going to present it. And it, it wasn't that way at all. It was a, a rigorous, uh, extensive process done under a lot of time pressure and a lot of, of pressure for secrecy, because it was only a very small group of people that knew what we were doing and that, as Josh was saying in Professor Gallagher's class, if that had uh, ever gotten out that we were working on this, that we were sitting on this, it would have completely undermined the whole enterprise, you know. So. And, and I will also say we had, to, in addition to taking consideration of that, to taking consideration of what happens to the publication if somehow we have some part of this wrong, I think from the very beginning, what I can say about the sourcing is that we had to be extraordinarily careful about every word that we put out about the PDF document that we put out. Because you because, knew that they would, your source would 
potentially be investigated? We knew that there would be some kind of inquiry into this, and we didn't know the scope of it, what it would be. There, I think we can, we've can. we said before that there were lawyers involved in the process. It wasn't only editors. We yeah. had to talk to people and find out like what could happen. Various people in the organization had questions like, might this happen? Might that happen? And so we had to think about as we were publishing and really right up until the moment we pushed the button, um, there's a balance between how do we give people enough information to support their conclusion that this is authentic while also not taking things that would, um, you know, assist other people in trying to identify source or sources. Yeah, you can't be emailing screenshots that have that are traceable, right? You just had to be extraordinarily be- um, careful in a way not different from if you're handling a story that involves classified information or other things where the person who gave it to you might have been breaking the law. I don't think that's what we have in this kind of situation exactly. But, um, you know, people have now proposed laws, including our <laughs> um, current uh, speaker, new speaker of the House, actually twice introduced a bill in the last two Congresses to make it illegal and make it a crime for a staffer at the Supreme Court to release confidential information. But we still felt like there would be some effort and we didn't know what form it would take. So we had to just keep that in the forefront of our minds from the beginning of working on the story all the way to publication and even sort of to this day. To this day. To this yeah. day. Um, Phil, I want to turn the conversation to you. Talk a little bit about what led to your project. How early was the seed planted for you that this was something you wanted to tackle? And how did you think about how to build it, what to include? who your audience was, what you were hoping to get them to understand. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, I, I came to this. I, I'm not a political reporter in the traditional sense. I'm an investigative reporter. Uh, and like I've heard from my colleagues here, a, as an investigative reporter, I was you know, often frustrated that about political coverage that really did not delve much beyond the day-to-day developments. You know, Republicans in, in, in the supermajority in Tennessee did this, Democrats complained, end of story. And, uh, and, and so it was a process that, especially with the decimation of print, when uh, print had traditionally had an army of people covering the, the state legislature in Tennessee and probably pretty much every other state in the country. And, and so just as a consumer of news, of political news, I was frustrated that the real story wasn't being told, that the whole story wasn't be, being told. Um, December of 2021, uh, I I take my annual vacation. I usually take about three to four weeks of vacation in December uh, after working my butt off all year long. Uh, and But I always like to go into December knowing what my big project is going to be for the coming year. Uh, and in December of 2021, I really didn't know, but I knew as a, as a citizen I was deeply concerned about the state of our democracy. And so I just sort of came out of that vacation thinking, whatever I'm going to do, it is going to help citizens understand what's happening in their democratic institutions. So you think because, um, because it was the year that had followed the attacks of January 6th, is that why it was top of mind? Or was it because of legislation that was happening in Tennessee, or was it because of post-COVID backlash or kind of the post-George Floyd uh, frame for thinking about politics? What, or was it really January 6th? Why why was democracy on your mind as the topic? Uh, All of the above. Uh, And uh, so I just, you know, as a citizen, I I just felt like, you know, that we could do better. The company I work for, EW Scripps, has a motto, and, and I'm I'm going to recount this motto, not you know, to suck up to the corporation, but I believe it. The motto is give light and the people will find their own way. And unfortunately, there's just not enough light that is being shined 
uh, when it comes to the state legislatures in, in this country. That, you know, that there has been so much focus on democracy at the national level. But the, the, the thing about the you know, Congress is Congress is by and large in a state of complete gridlock. Nothing much happens in Congress. Uh, and so special interests who want to fundamentally reshape our society, they're going to the state legislatures to do that. Uh, and, and and so in in my mind, state you know every state legislature in the country needs to be turned into an investigative group to explain to people what's going on and why. I mean, we kicked off this project. Uh, in January of 2022. Uh, and there's a tradition that anyone in, in state politics in Tennessee knows about, but the citizens don't know about, is the day before the legislature goes into session, the uh, legislative leaders hold a series of fundraisers for a day and a half, just one fundraiser after another. What's it called? Um, well, it doesn't have a name. I call it the fundraising frenzy. Uh, and, uh, and and basically, they're hitting up the lobbyists who want some during the preemptively. It's not quid pro quo if you get the money first. Exactly. Got it. Uh, and, uh, and and so it's become an annual tradition of we're going to you know you know hit up these lobbyists for as much money as we can, knowing that they need us. And, uh, and but that money then goes to help the supermajority maintain its group in power, uh, and, and and that was you know I, I think that piece was unheard of when it comes to local television. I, I think that piece was probably ten to twelve minutes long, uh, but it, it really gave you know an unprecedented insight into how the process works. How many years had you known about the fundraising frenzy? Oh, um, you know, most of my career, I mean, I started out in print. Joel and I, you know, almost crossed paths at the Tennessee end uh, in, uh, when, when I was in print. Uh, and, you know, there was an army of, you know, reporters covering the legislature at that time. Um, and, and, and that's the thing that comes from institutional knowledge and having better uh, around for a while is that there are things that you know all Capitol Hill reporters know about, uh, but it's almost never uh, a situation where a lot is is shined on those. Because it's things. sort of admission to the club. It's like, well, now I'm covering the legislature, right? Now, so I've learned that this thing happens. But was it because you had set your mind to doing this project that you were like? That should be part of this. That should be the way we start this. Yeah, and, and, and the way we did it was we staked out, for example, the House Speaker's fundraiser. Uh, and you know, I, I'm sort of narrating as we go along, saying, "Well, that's the liquor lobbyist. That's the beer lobbyist. That's that's the lobbyist for the charter schools." And 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 tying the money to the issue. Uh, and and so we. You know, for the last almost two years now, we've continued this project uh, and showing, you know, for example, how the supermajority uses the rules to silence dissent, uh, and um, and 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 we we more more recently, the John Oliver Show highlighted our work in a local political race where you had white supremacists involved in the Franklin race. County race, Fort Franklin, Tennessee. Oh, Frank, oh, right, the city of Franklin, city, right, city sorry. Franklin. Yeah, and and in that case, I should show up a candidate form. Uh, there are white supremacists there, one who had actually threatened to kill me, you know, 25 years ago. Uh, and because of having the institutional knowledge, I'm able to say, you know, this is so-and-so. And, and to actually, again, give light. And, and it became a huge national issue that you had actually kind of tied to white supremacists. Uh, and, but, you know, when voters went to the polls, it was an unprecedented voter turnout, uh, and she was rejected for the Um, Both of your uh, stories and packages have had real impact, but I also want to pick up on something that you just alluded to, and um, 
tell me if you don't want to talk about it, but uh, the idea that uh, not only that there was someone who's wanted to kill you for the last 25 years, uh, but uh, but the um, in, in the sort of Twitter and post Twitter X, whatever we're in age, um, there's uh, so much more of, of an ease and an automaticness of um, uh, some critics really attacking reporters, threatening reporters, verbally attacking them, but also threatening to physically attack them. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, uh, to what extent you have felt a danger to your safety in the wake of, of some of this reporting that you're talking about now? Well, uh, in the case of the Franklin, Tennessee uh, mayor's race, the white supremacists uh, became quite uh, uh, aggravated that uh, I had outed them. Uh, and so there were on their telegram channels, they were posting photos of me uh and saying that the quote day of the rope is coming uh it's a, an allusion to the turner diaries when you know the, the so-called traders are hung uh and so there were repeated references to that the fact that um you know my time to be hung is going to come uh they they got really vicious and started doxing some of their candidates opponents uh, and for those of you who don't know what doxing means, uh, the, on their Telegram channels, they were posting home addresses, uh, phone numbers, um, uh, in, in one case, uh, vehicle description, tag number of uh, opponents. Uh, that they put out one uh, Telegram post uh, dictating to me that what my next story should say uh, and that there would be repercussions if it didn't say that, uh, and, um, and and that that was a pretty intense period. And you know, here in the past week, I've picked off uh, some of the more extreme MAGA people, uh, and uh, uh, some of the accounts have uh, directed their followers to just blame me. And um, I, I had phone calls saying I'm an enemy of the people and I need to be exterminated. Uh, so it, it's real. It's real. And then at that point, you have to take precautions and, and try to protect your own safety. How about for you guys? How much of a blowback uh, did you face uh, either rhetorically or did you ever feel physically threatened after um, uh, after breaking the story and, and continuing to cover it? I mean, not personally, not really. Um, I mean, one of the things we discussed was you know, when and, and Politico thought about it, like this story comes out, are they going to come after Josh? Are they going to come after me? Are they going to come after Politico? And Politico took specific safety measures, but I, I can say, uh, you know, my, my wife was pretty nervous. Uh, she was worried that we just recently bought a house. That means you can, if you care enough, you can find our address and all that. And, um, you know, we have the ring security system. So, and I didn't tell her what I was working on, but I texted her, I was like, hey, this is the thing I've been working on. And then within like three minutes, you know, my phone goes, an alarm activated. <laughs> um, <laughs> And then she and Politico was pretty open. They said, "Look, if you, you know, if you or anyone feels like you're in trouble, uh, you know, go go to a hotel. Don't go to the Four Seasons, but go to a hotel, and and you'll be all right." Um, I will say, I, I my previous when I was at Vox with a V V O X, um, I it's wrote a story. <laughs> Clear <laughs> at the Pentagon, they like it when I slur the V. Sure. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I, I wrote a story about some abuses within the Marine Corps and sort of the, um, yeah, there's issues going on within the Marine Corps. And that felt way more dangerous. I mean, they were coming after me like crazy. They were, they were little things. They who? Sorry, no, like people in the Marine Corps, Marine Corps boosters. Uh, they were saying, like, if you see this, they're putting a if you see him on the street, please punch him in the face or something. Uh, yeah, so like, well, that punch could land. And if a punch was the worst that happened, it would be, you know, right. Like, I mean, right? Uh, but you know, there, there were more. But anyway, like that was that was my face was on Breitbart. I should say when that story came out, I was looking at wedding venues for my then fiance, uh, and I had friends calling me being like, dude, I'm so sorry. Um, so anyway, I was sort of that was where my head was at, that that was gonna come. Uh, it didn't reach that. And I think actually a big part of it was uh, Chief Justice John Roberts the next day was like, look, this thing is real. Um, so you know, Josh and I didn't really become the story. Um, the, the story was the story, but, but and, yeah. It's worth pondering if if Chief Justice Roberts had not come out and said that the draft was real, 
you you know you could imagine there would be denials out there that it was not real then there could be people claiming that politico had faked this to try to bring about some outcome or something and then i think you would have seen a, a real uh you know open season of harassment um and so um so Josh and, and Alex, who are really on the front lines and that had uh, really steeled themselves or fared, they knew what they were doing. Um, but I think I think we were all uh, very, um, uh, we all breathed a sigh of relief when Chief Justice Roberts uh, confirmed that and, it was that. And one quick thing, you know, we the public, we post a story at 8.32 p.m. May 2nd, That's, that doesn't leave my head. Um, and then you're watching the TVs and you're seeing, you know, MSNBC Cup picks it up and others pick it up. And uh, Hannity on Fox News is the first one to pick it up, really, for Fox. And he starts talking, he's, he's explaining it. And then at some point, he just goes, I just don't think this is real. There's no way this would show up. There's no way Politico has this, et cetera. Shannon Bream, who's now uh, in charge of uh, Sunday show, but she's a legal report. And I believe it clerked for Justice Thomas. Is that right? Yeah. So at, at some point, as, as she's on and Hannity's going, I don't think this is true. And she goes, you know, Sean, I have it from very good authority that this is real. <laughs> and Hannity's like, no, I still don't buy it. She goes, Sean. <laughs> I have it from a very good authority <laughs> through the teeth. Like, this is real. So that I think it sort of moved the needle or early. Even before that. And I'll say, you know, in terms of quasi threats, um, you know, the, after the investigation um, came out, um, you may know that there was, I think Peter alluded to the fact there was a uh, Supreme Court investigation into what, how this document had leaked out. And they said the result was that they couldn't. Um, to their whatever standard they were using, they sort of suggested they had a few different suspects, but they couldn't say to a level of certainty who who it was. But they had found a, a series of weaknesses in their physical and cybersecurity that they had not considered before, and they listed what some of them were, and then they didn't list what others were. Shortly after that came out, um, the uh, uh, former President Trump had a couple of different rallies. Um, announced that he would have been able to determine um, who the source was. In one day. The method that he would have used was to put Alex and I in jail. Jesus. And then there was another sort of added on part to that that I'm not going to get into right now. And he said it wouldn't take very long in this situation for Alex and I to like mess up about exactly who, who the source was. So, you know, and it's it's sort of funny. No, it's not. But it's I mean, it's not, not funny. It's not right? funny because, though. you know, there's, uh, you see Trump and other figures make these sorts of provocative statements all the time. And, you know, yeah, 99.9% .9 of people are going to sort of throw that off as like part of his rhetorical, um, you know, spiel that he does where he says all kinds of, you know, that's probably the seventh most outrageous thing that he said in that those particular speeches. And it wouldn't even really be reported very much. But what about that 0.01% of the crowd or the 0.01% who are watching that and somehow decide that this is something they personally um, need to get involved in? So that part of it is sort of, uh, fortunately for us, he hasn't, he didn't get fixated on it and he hasn't brought it up in recent months, but, but it's something and it's that not the president he also. led yeah. to another round of emails at Politico and security consultants appearing again and being like, what, what if this becomes part of the basic stump speech? Um, fortunately, he didn't say our name. So again, for people that are unbalanced, it's probably a little better for them not to say Politico or not to say our names, which which he didn't. But um, again, you know, so anyway, that's just it, something we had to be it was concerned about. Super helpful that other outlets put our names and our photos up on their stories. About <laughs> right. Super appreciated by our colleagues elsewhere in the media world. Right. Um, I want to make sure we have uh, time to turn to audience um, questions. I, I think the, the point that you're making is really important, though, because um, we're talking about we're talking about democracy through the lens of covering legislatures or covering the high court, but also our freedom, our rights, our ability to cover them, to be protected. Uh, when we when we write things that are true, even if they're disturbing to people, that all emanates from our democratic system also and from the rule of law and the First Amendment and um, all of these things that protect our ability to be the, the eyes and ears and the voice of the public. Um, as we, I want, uh, we're going to go to questions in just a minute. Um, so please be thinking about what you want to ask. And, and as you uh, do line up and come forward, uh, if you're open to it, please 
share your name and, and what you're studying or what you do here at Syracuse. You don't have to, but if you would, that'd be great. Um, I want to ask you one last question as we get ready to do that, um, which is, um, I feel like um, a lot of Americans have news fatigue. I mean, they have politics fatigue. We know that, but they have news fatigue too. And um, this is something that I think we're all struggling with is how do you bring people who are disengaged back into the fold and, and find a way to connect them with information that could really help them. I feel like it's also a challenge on college campuses where a lot of students have news fatigue, including a lot of journalism students have news fatigue. And they think, God, do I really wanna, politicians at the national level at least, can't get anything done. Why should I even bother covering? politics or the Supreme Court. Um, so at the risk of sounding old fashioned, what is your counter argument to that? Why is this a useful career pursuit? Well, I think that we're all engaged in a, uh, a real uh, struggle and uh, a great mission to try to restore trust and faith in the uh, media. And I think that um, early in my career, it was so obvious that there was just so much more of a recognition on uh, the idea that journalists were uh, the voice of the public, uh, that transparency was a positive good for society, that the questions that we were asking were going to make the world better. And uh, that has changed dramatically. There have been a lot of different factors that have come into play. Obviously, the explosion of outlets with the internet has done that to a large extent, the explosion of ideological outlets, the sense that people want to have like-minded sort of sources and interlocutors. Giving. So those of us who are in the mainstream media have to kind of earn the status that we might have gotten a little bit too easily 30 or 40 years ago by being the ones who had the printing press or the uh, television license when there were only three that you know three channels in town and uh it's very very important to make clear to the public our procedures our standards our ethics and the extent to which the work that we do is a public service and we've been talking about that along those lines but i think journalists are a little bit uncomfortable doing that. And I think it would help for students and for all of us in the profession to just understand what that, what that core mission is. And that once people have a sense of trust and have an open mind and approach it, I think some of that news fatigue you're talking about will disappear because the fatigue comes from the confirmation bias. It comes from the algorithm. It comes from every time I turn on Apple News, I'm getting pounded with a hundred examples of whatever it was I was last looking at. You know, if I was last looking at a story, this real example this week of some, you know, 18 year old who died in the Caribbean while water skiing or something, I've now got like five more stories of young people who've died tragically in accidents. And it's like, you know, wait, this isn't an obsession of mine, but the algorithm is telling me that I need to, and I think that's where the fatigue comes in. You know, it's like you feel bombarded. Um, I wanna be mindful of our time. Uh, could we start with some questions? Yes. I guess we're doing pass and play. Um, hi, my name is Luke Gradle. I'm a sophomore studying broadcast journalism and political science in Newhouse and Maxwell. Uh, first, I want to say that I'm very starstruck to be here with the people who broke the story of overturning Roe. But as an avid John Oliver viewer, I'm even more starstruck to be here with the <laughs> Phil Williams. Starstruck, by the way. My, <laughs> my, my wife is like the most exciting thing about this is you're going to be with. with, with. That's fantastic, <laughs> right? Um, I want to ask all of you, though, because I did watch your reporting uh, on Revealed. And I think an interesting through line of all of your reporting is talking about stories that are unreported, underreported, or perhaps misreported. A lot of times when you're working on stories like that, the sourcing and getting to know sources it's difficult because they either aren't used to talking to reporters or don't want to talk to reporters. So as people who want to get better in the craft, what are some tips and techniques you all have as to how to work with sources better, even when they don't want to talk to you? With the, with the caveat that we're not asking you who your sources were on that project, but in general, how do you think about sourcing? Well, uh, th th this may sound corny, but there's a, Mr. Rogers' line, uh, if any of you watched Mr. Rogers when you were little, but 
uh, it, the message to kids was if you're in trouble, look for the helpers. <laughs> that, that, that's what I do uh, as a journalist. Uh, I look for the white hats, the people who want to make government a better place. Uh, and and so, you know, just starting out as a journalist, you know, I would say look for the white hats, look for the people who want, you know, the world to be different, who, who, who want to shine a light on how things really work. Uh, and 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 from the beginning of my career till now, I'm always looking for the helpers, looking for the white hats to, to help me understand the process. And then for the flip side of what you said. You know, sometimes if people don't want to talk, that's that's the story too. And, and, and if you look at my reporting, there's lots of people who don't want to talk to me, but I'm still proud. Um, one, so I wanted to pick up on one thing that Phil said, and I think um, Margaret, you also mentioned the grid. You guys both mentioned the gridlock, and so I do think that part of what's going on is. Um, that because Congress is like hopelessly gridlocked, not only is stuff going to the state legislatures to be fought about and implemented because they actually get stuff passed and done, a lot of people are going to court. So that's like, you know, there's all kinds of different things going on. It's not like everything is static. And now we're like, why don't we do a third of our coverage on this in court? 30 years ago, it might not have deserved a third of our, our coverage, but I think it's getting, um, Closer to that. In terms of your question about um, the sourcing, I mean, I think that one way you do it is you go to things, and just to be blunt about it, that maybe you don't care about that much or that you don't plan um, to write things about. So, like in my field, it turns out that every um, every one of the circuits of the federal courts for each part of the country has an annual conference. And Peter actually has because of this wonderful recent book, has been invited to a lot of them as a speaker, but most of them you can go as a journalist. And so, you know, is there always something there that you can turn into a story? No, but um, those people actually want to be covered. Like, that's the weird part about it. Like, they are so delighted if you show up because sometimes they get one reporter or two reporters. And... Um, that anybody would come and express interest in them, like, you know, the chief judge or whatever will come up at lunchtime and say, I just want to thank you for coming or whatever, to right. Philadelphia or whatever. Yeah, you know. your cell phone right, right. <laughs> and then he gives you his business card or whatever and says, if there's anything I can do for you, like, you know, let me let me know. So. And then what do you do then? Do you send that judge uh, a text on your birthday every year for Christmas and say, no, no, I, I haven't, I haven't uh, tried that, but, but, um, you know, then you find out that some of these people are more, um, more involved, for example, in the political system and in the news coverage than you would think. I put a little, I, there, something was, you know, it wasn't a very fascinating event, but there was something kind of funny, like a story that was told at dinner by one of the speakers about um, refereeing a dispute between her children, you know, and because of who the speaker was. It was kind of a funny nugget, and I fed it to one of our newsletters. And literally at 7:45 the next morning at breakfast, this judge comes up to me, and we're and I say hello to him. He says hello to me, and he says, "Oh, that's where it came from." And I'm like, "What do you mean that's where it came from?" He's like, "Well, I was reading a playbook this morning in my hotel before I came down here, and I saw that item in there, and I was wondering how did you guys know that she had said that in that speech last night." So it turns out that a lot of these people are watching more closely and they're really just looking for someone to engage with them, which isn't always the easiest thing, but sometimes you can find a more um, uh, a situation to engage with them where it's not like you're coming through the door and saying, I demand an explanation for this thing that's going on. And, and jumping in, I've collected cell phone numbers like people collecting baseball cards. <laughs> you know what you're gonna... right. Right. Um, and... Any other sourcing tips, or do you want to? Can we can we fit in a couple more questions? Hi, uh, my name is Natasha Sinyanovich. I um, hello, Phil. Hello. I used to be the public radio uh, anchor, an anchor in Nashville, so I've known about Phil for years, and uh, it made me chuckle that today when I messaged him that I was going to come. One of my last messages was, 
you know, if you see Phil coming at you with a folder full of receipts or FOIAs, you can run, but you're not going to get very far. <laughs> you know, we've, we've in Nashville, we've been saying that for years. Um, it is hard to overstate how much investigative work Phil has done that you've done, Phil. Um, there are some weeks where it feels like there'd be like three big projects a week coming out. Can you talk a little bit? Can you explain to, to I know you mentioned that you work with a team. Can you tell students here who are very interested in becoming investigative reporters what that looks like what what how big your team is and and how that work is is shared among them uh, it's not big enough um I, I i tell students often that um you know, if, if you follow your passion your work will never seem quite like a chore uh and and this is just my passion uh my, my wife will tell you i struggle with work-life balance <laughs> <laughs> um, because I, I'm just always hungry for the next big scoop. Uh, we have uh, a team that is um, three other reporters, uh, two photojournalists, and a producer. Uh, and um, But I, I do a lot of my own work uh, with uh, as far as the research. Uh, I have a producer that I will call in and when when I realize, okay, this is bigger than I can do myself, uh, that, that I'll pull him in. Uh, I've worked primarily with one photojournalist, but we'll pull in others as, as needed. Um, you know, I, the, the thing I, I would say that's key to my success is just never stop being curious. I'm, I'm, I'm reading a in, on, in the Sunday New York Times about a scandal in Albany. And I'm always thinking, it's like, hmm, I bet that's happening here. And how can I find it if it's happening here? Uh, do you literally keep a list of like, stop, do you, yeah. I'm not going to ask you where, yeah. lest someone st <laughs> steal your phone and jump into your notes, but you do, you keep a running notebook. Do you guys keep running notebooks of ideas? Yeah. Sorry to cut you off. Oh no, but uh, so so. Um, but I mean, it, it's it, it's just part of who I am, uh, and and I, I think you know to be successful, you know, my generation is accustomed to working around the clock. Uh, Why are you looking at me? I hear from managers support that perhaps younger generations, you know, expect to start at nine and end at five and um, Wrong business. Yeah, that, that, that's just you, man. I work. <laughs> um, I think we might have time for one more amazing question. No pressure, but it really has to be amazing to close us out. And then hopefully you guys can hang out for a couple minutes if there are some questions off mic. Yeah, also, sure. can we get a last question? And can it be fabulous? Oh, that's a lot of pressure. Um, my name is Juhi, and I'm a photojournalism major here, um, and I'm a junior. And I wanted to ask: seems like the nature of investigative journalism is comes with threats naturally like both from the public like the marine corps and also from higher up officials like trump so i wanted to ask like what you guys think is the future of the first amendment and if it's at risk in case anyone couldn't hear uh it's uh given all the threats and technological changes what is the future of the first amendment right i i think that's up to you it's up to us uh, my my um, guiding mantra has always been, if I don't do it, who will? And, um, and you know, there are times that it's tough. And, um, you know, lately there have been times I've thought, you know, wow, this, this is a lot. Do I really <laughs> want to keep on doing this? But if if we walk off the field, you know, in the face of this kind of adversity, then our democracy does so. So it's really incumbent upon you to, to say, I'm going to engage in the struggle for, for our democracy, to, to be a truth teller, uh, and, and to not shy away even when it gets tough because it's, it's important work. Can we preserve the First Amendment in the era of AI? I would say, well, <laughs> I'm sorry, was that a perception? <laughs> That's a whole Pandora's box right there. We, we don't know the implications fully in, in that kind of thing. But I was going to uh, sort of amplify a little bit on what Phil was was saying and that I was walking. We took a tour a little bit earlier. Our tour guide is here in the, in the room, a wonderful tour of this building. 
And the words of the First Amendment are there on your wall, right? And what does it say? It says, Congress shall make no law to abridge freedom of speech and freedom of the press. And what you immediately think is, why have a separate grant of freedom of the press if you already have freedom of speech? And the answer is that the founding fathers envisioned the press and the institutional media as a check on power. It's part of the constitutional system. And it's different from freedom of speech. It's not everybody on their laptop sounding off. It's a concerted group of investigative reporters like Josh, like Alex, like Phil, like many of you, who play a role in keeping the American system honest. And so I think it is very much embedded in the American system. I think that after the, in the wake of the digital changeover, things have become more complicated and the business model has been disrupted for news media. But as it recovers and as we recover, we have to hold fast to those, those core principles. Amazing, uh, any last words? Josh, Alex. If it was Justice Alito, scratch your nose. <laughs> <laughs> I tried oh, no. that. It has not worked. It has not worked yet. Be a statue. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. <laughs> That's his towel when he goes like that. You know how it means, right? Uh, on behalf of DeLodato, on behalf of the faculty, on behalf of the Toner Prize Committee, um, I would like to thank all of you for your work, for being here with us tonight all of you for your questions and being part of this. Um, thank you very much.